my pleasure to be here to talk to you. Uh, normally, I'm mostly addressing shipping conferences and so on, so this is a new experience for me as well. But hopefully you can get something out of uh, looking into what's happening in another industry, and that would be the marine industry. Um, I'm going to talk about a topic that I addresses at a lot of conference, which is called ship intelligence. And it's really about a big change that is happening in the marine industry at the moment. And that is something that will, of course, also be a little bit linking in to the world of, that you are living in. And there are some exciting new developments happening. <laughs> but before I go there, it might be worth telling you a little bit where I come from. I'm not sure you're all familiar with uh, the company Rolls-Royce. Um, the first thing I will say, we do not make cars. Uh, that was maybe what a lot of people think. But uh, what we do is uh, basically we have an aerospace business doing gas turbines, and then we have what we call land and sea doing diesel engines, uh, marine business, and a nuclear business. So the nuclear thing is something that is about uh, nuclear reactors for submarines. I'm not allowed to know what they do. Uh, and then there's a little bit of automation system and so on. But I come from the marine side, which is uh, basically a fairly large business for marine. The census is like about 1.7 billion pounds of uh, revenue. And we are dealing with basically all types of ships, but mainly uh, we are strong in the offshore segments, oil and gas uh, part of it. And what we do there is anything from the initial design of a ship through most of the technical equipment. We have engines, deck machinery, propellers, automation, electrical systems, all that. But we do not build the ship ourselves. We let the yards do that. But otherwise, we can supply a very, very wide range of products. And then we like to integrate them all into it. So that's our business, where I come from. That's enough with the company talk. Then I go into the real topic of today. And to let, set the scene, I would like to talk a little bit about what's happening in Marie. And I have asked my designer to make an illustration about what's happening. And this is what he came up with. Uh, so it's clear now, good. Maybe I'll explain it a little bit. In marine world, we're actually living at a stage where there's a lot of new regulations coming into place. And Regulations are, of course, good from the fact that it's driving the industry forward, but it's also putting some challenges on us. And there are especially environmental things coming in online to reduce the emissions from ships. Today is mainly about uh, SOx and NOx emissions, which is really something to address acid rain that happened back in the 80s. So we are acting fast in the marine business. Today, the society is, of course, more concerned about CO2 and human health. So that is the upcoming things. We will see more focus on particle emissions and, and, and uh, CO2 in the future. But the thing that is actually this is, is the, the regulations are driving also a shift in the fuel we use. Currently, ships today burn mostly heavy fuel. So that's basically a waste product from the refineries. Uh, that will change in the future. We will see cleaner fuels taking a bigger role, especially gas, LNG coming into the picture. And uh, being part of the marine fuel. The other thing that uh, is ongoing today, which you probably all know, is, is oil price. Oil price is very low. And that is, of course, a trend. It always goes up and down and, and is fluctuating. But that has a big impact on shipping, both in the, in the form of setting the cost for the ships, but it's also driving the activity, and especially in the offshore segment, which is one of our big parts. And this is why one of the areas where really the new things are happening in marine. This is where a lot of the cool technology is being introduced first and so on. So these are really the high-tech vessels of the sea, are these offshore vessels. But unfortunately, today there's a little bit of slowdown in that area, and we're hoping for a little bit higher oil price to, to get activity going there again. But these ships are really the ones that, where you see battery technology coming into place, permanent magnet thrusters and other things like this. So. If you look at the more, kind of say, cargo uh, vessels or traditional vessels, there it's all about efficiency, a little bit new fuels, as mentioned before. And there, I mean, this world is really dominated by, by China at the moment. They are the biggest builder of ships. 
and they're also becoming one of the biggest owner of ships. So there's a big shift towards Asia that has been ongoing for quite some time in, in, in this area. The other big trend, which is really the topic of today, is ship intelligence and what's happening around there. That's the big technology trend that's <coughs> happening everywhere in, in marine today. And it's really starting up to be quite exciting. The other thing that's related to that is, of course, connectivity. Ships are not standing alone. They are not standalone units at, at, at sea. They are really getting connected to the rest of the world. And the satellites are an important piece of that. So these are some of the things happening in marine business at the moment, the trends that are ongoing. And as mentioned, the te te ship intelligence is one thing. And that is, of course, not a pure marine thing. It's happening everywhere in society. I mean, you might talk about well, digitalization, be that Internet of Things, Industry 4.0, big data. A lot of names, meaning a little bit different things, but all basically kind of hype words at the moment today. We must admit, okay, a lot of this development is, is basically the lead in this is the consumer market. But other industries are following on. And then the thing you can say about, about all this is that really it is a game changer. We have seen really big companies go out of business because of this, and we've seen new ones coming up and becoming real big players. And that's, of course, something we, that might happen in the marine sector as well that there are some new upcoming business models that will take over. The other thing to notice from this is really data is value. And, and that goes across all sectors. But if you then look at marine, I, instead of talking about industry 4.0 or Internet of Things, we like to talk about ship intelligence. Because we think this describes a little bit more the marine domain, what's happening there. And we really like to say that we are at the dawn of a new era. So what will this ship intelligence era contain? If you look into our crystal ball and imagine where the future is going, on the operation side, it's basically going to change so that the ships are not standalone units. They are going to be an integrated part of a much larger machinery larger operation, be that the total logistic chain or actually the total production of something. It's also going to mean that it's going to be, be a much more optimized world. Everything is going to be optimized. How you utilize your asset, and, and it's really going to step away from just optimizing small parts of the ship operation to total fleet. And, and, and uh, it's not only going to be going to optimize the cost, also the revenue. If you look at the business side, one of the uh, clear things we can notice there is that the big are getting bigger. There is consolidation happening in the market. And that is really, if you look at the shipping companies out there, I think the average ship size or number of ships that you have per ship owner is eight. And if you know that there are some players with hundreds of ships, it means that there are a lot of very small players who only have a hand, maybe one or two ships. And it's really hard for these ships. How should they stay competitive with the big players? So there, there's actually my, so to speak, prediction. The big will get stronger. They will have the, 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 the manpower and resources to really up their game and, and, and become more and more efficient. So the small ones have to do something. So either they go out of business or they start to joining up and form alliances and, and play in a new model. And there is maybe something will happen. Maybe we can look at Uber or some of the other players things that happen in other sectors. Can there be new startups that really start playing the game of ship owners? Maybe there will be big uh, ship operating businesses without, without a single ship. They will just use assets of other companies. So this is a really exciting time in that sense that there are some new business models that most likely will emerge here. And also how you finance ships. Um, today, I mean, there is a little bit problem to get finance for building new ships. Um, it's not always that easy. So, is there a possibility for group financing? Actually, back in Germany, the KGM system was something close to this kind of startup group financing that you could have. But it might take a new form in the marine business again. So, there are things happening there. How you manage your ship then, it will all be, be based on total awareness. Really, 
optimizing and remotely monitoring what's happening to your, your ship and, 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 and operate it there. It's about providing remote support and, and going away from buying the stuff and then doing some service to it, maybe to more pay for the use you actually do. And, and so it's a bit leasing the entire machinery for the ship, for example. And how we will build ships in the future will be that we will be, have much more standardized systems in them. This sounds odd maybe to you who are not familiar with, with the shipping business, but frankly, most ships today are prototypes. You order a ship, then, they, then the yard design it and build it and deliver it to you. So the ship that comes out is really the prototype. It's not like in the airline industry or car industry where you build a lot of test units and you test it and verify everything and so on. So marine industry is really very capable of turning uh, basically designs in, directly into a working, the working product that is sold. Uh, but at the same time, it also means that everything is not really validated and optimized to the level that you could afford if you had bigger series. So there I see a change coming up. And this will, of course, mean that either the shipyards get bigger in order to be able to big, build really big volumes, or the role of the system integrator, such as our company, becomes even more important. So if that's the shipping part in, mar in, in the ship intelligence era, so what is really ship intelligence if you look at the technology side? We like to group it under six headings. So it's everything from optimizing the ship, how it performs. Uh, it's about providing decision support for the crew while telling them how to run it efficiently, the ship, or act in a case of emergency. If you run the ground, we need to be able that the ship provides some sort of input to the crew, what to do. Will, should, he, should the captain evacuate the ship or not? How should he minimize the damage? And so on. So it's both about optimizing and then providing decision support to the crew. It's also about smart navigation and advanced uh, uh, positioning systems. So everything from your electronic charts all the way to actually having fully advanced autopilots and situational awareness of what's happening around the ship. Um, it's about condition management. Today we want to basically monitor the health of the equipment on board the ship. And that will grow to become more and more so that we actually monitor the whole ship. And, uh, and uh, it will involve basically predictive maintenance <laughs> schemes and even robots and other things doing some part of the maintenance. It's of course also about normal <coughs> automation. Everything from automatic reporting all the way to fully autonomous ships. And related to that is, of course, also about remote operation and control in either the entire ship or part of the ship. So these are the six headings that we put under ship intelligence. As you see, it's a broad thing. But it's really about the, the added value we can provide in form of, of, of smart operations. Of course, a lot of this has existed in ships. I mean, we already deliver automation control systems for ships, and we have been doing that for for years. And um, if you look at the bridge today, it's not any kind of low-tech flex. This is the first big high-end bridge today, what we call the unified bridge, where we really bring together the entire control of, of the whole ship into one place. And we put it behind this kind of touch screen displays, which is, of course, quite standard today. But uh, I would say most ships you go on board, this is not the world. You have basically 30 different suppliers bringing their own basically manual control panel to the ship. So getting everything to look the same, feel the same behind the touch screen is really state of art in the marine world. But we don't want to stop there. We want to go beyond that. So what we foresee is, is fully adjustable consoles, head-up displays, really providing the operating experience for the owner, using augmented reality to highlight the information that is important for the owner, giving guidance where it's safe to operate, where it's not, communicating between the ship operator and maybe a crane operator and oil rig, where they can share different views, inform each other what they do uh, with, with uh, this kind of augmented reality and situational awareness. So there are some exciting developments in that world. The other thing that's happening is that we are connecting ships. We are logging data, connecting ships both to shore and so on. 
So at the ship today, we are monitoring a lot of things, collecting data, because we see this will be value in the future. <coughs> or it's value already today, but it's going to grow even further. And what we do with this data is we, of course, optimize the energy use on board the ship, and, and also the, the, uh, in the future also the revenue side. <coughs> We will use it for equipment and system health monitoring. Today we train the, our, the large equipment that we supply, the health of it, and we can then predict when we need to maintain them. And this is something we have been doing quite, for quite some time actually on the aerospace side. We have a lot of gas turbines out there that we are trending all the time. And we know if something needs to be done, so when the airplane lands, we have a service team ready there to support it. At the same time, we also see that we will need, in the future, more and more expert support. It's not easy for the crew on board the ship to be able to be experts on all the products and equipment that is on board. So in the future, we foresee that we will have these experts sitting on land rudder and logging into the user at the ship. He puts on his augmented reality helmet, and they can talk and, and give advice what to do and how to, to service and maintain the ship. Other remote opportunities that are out there is actually to control maybe ROVs remotely or the deck operation of the ship. So instead of having the people controlling this area sitting on the ship, why not have them on land? So already today, if you look at the anchor handler like this, we have these robotic arms that do the movements because we don't want to have people out there on the aft deck in, the, in this operation because it's a dangerous area to be in. But instead of controlling them from inside the ship, why not do it from land? So that's a little bit what's happening. And if you look at a ship today, there is a certain level of ship intelligence out there. There are some electronic navigation, there is some sort of uh, optimization and, and fleet monitoring, and there is a little bit of, uh, shall we say, condition-based maintenance and so on. But in the future it will grow. We will go from ship level optimization to total fleet level optimization. We will have automatic systems on board in the form of mooring and so on, and cargo handling. The whole ship will be sensored, so we really know the condition of all systems on board and we have predictive maintenance. And part of the ship or an entire ship can be remotely operated or autonomous, which is really the next step that we foresee. And we are going towards a world with fully unmanned ships. It will not be for all ships, but some ships will go to the situation where they are totally uh, operated from, from the shore remotely or they are acting autonomously. And why we are doing this is all about making shipping more efficient and safe. So of course the most obvious thing if you look at the unmanned ship is that if we take away the crew, we will reduce the crew cost of it. But that's only a small part of the whole picture. It's also about utilizing the crew that we have more efficiently and, and getting access to the best people. It's about providing better working conditions for people and improving efficiency. Actually, there's a lot of fuel saving in going without people on the ship. And it's about improving the safety. And you can say this trend is, of course, something that's happening everywhere in society right now. We have unmanned trains and metros we have all seen and heard of the uh, unmanned uh, flying drones. And uh, pretty much every car manufacturer are developing a car that can drive itself. I mean, Google Car being, of course, one of the more visible ones. But pretty much everyone is doing it. So it's really happening everywhere in society right now. So for us, it's not really a question, is it coming to marine? It's only a question, when? And in marine, we have, throughout history, trying to be, be make shipping more efficient and reduce the number of people. So you see, there's really been a drastic reduction of how many people are operating a ship. And it's a little bit question, why would we stop here? And um, I do think we will go forward. The other aspect of this is really to think about, are we utilizing the crew efficient? We train up top-skilled captains. They go through years and years of training to operate the ship. And how much of their time do they actually spend doing that? Well, I can tell you, it's only a few percent. Most of their time is about 
doing paperwork, bureaucracy, administration, and supervise. It's not really about operating the ship in and out of a port. So, because a ship, most of the time, it's out at sea. And today, we, we load the ship with so much bureaucracy that the captain is fully busy. So it's really a question, if we have this top-skilled captain, shouldn't he be doing something more than just this few percent of, of, of drive? And then you come to the point that actually one captain should drive more than one ship. And then you need to say, OK, then he cannot be on all the ships all the time, so we need to have him do it remotely. We put him on land, and he remote controls the ship. And then one captain can drive 10 ships, or maybe 10 captain more like can drive 100 ships. And that's where we see this going. So we foresee that we will have this kind of shore-based remote control stations, where you create a total awareness of what's happening around the ship. You have 360-degree cameras, you have infrared cameras, you have close proximity <laughs> radars, and, and of course the conventional radars, and so on. And you build up a total awareness of what's happening around the ship. And then a person can actually operate the ship remotely, instead of being on the ship. So this is some of the development we do. And this is, of course, quite closely related to some of the simulators we have. These are some pictures of simulators we have in, in our training center in, in Olesund in Norway. So you see the big ball there. That's just, just one simulator where we train crew how to operate ship. So it's a very realistic picture. And already from there, just taking the link and putting the control to the ship, it's actually quite a small step to, to control it remotely. Of course, a little bit more technical things in there. But, but Basically, the technology is there to do it. The exciting thing is, of course, with this is if we go remotely, we can provide a much better working condition for the people. A lot of seafarers, they don't like being away from their family and friends. In, be in the beginning, it might be exciting to get away, but at the end of the day, maybe shipping isn't that romantic anymore as it used to be. Uh, it's short times in port it's, uh, and, mm -hmm. and so on. So if we can provide a nice place that is not rocking, heaving, pitching. It's, it's a better working condition for the people. Uh, what we say uh, is that we will do part of the operation remotely, but we don't foresee that the captain would sit and drive the ship all the time from a remote control center, because then the saving is not that big. So what we really say is that when the ship is out at sea, the ship should be able to do the operation autonomously. It should drive itself. It's only being supervised from ashore that everything is OK. And the ship should select its own route <coughs> that is the most optimum. It should avoid other traffic, and so on. But when it comes close to port, you would, or when something special happens, you would pull the control of the ship from autonomous mode into remote control mode, where you then have a captain overseeing the operation and, 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 and the decision the ship does in the bank, so that you still have a human in the loop, so to speak. And this is how we see it happen. There are other views in the market how this should go about, and it's not black and white, there are different views on it. And that's maybe something I want to stress. Even though I talk about unmanned ships and autonomous ships, it doesn't mean that it's applicable to all ships, and it doesn't mean that even if you go for a remote controlled autonomous ship, it doesn't mean fully that it must be without crew. Some ships, like passenger vessels, might still benefit from having some people on board. <laughs> the only thing is that we <clears throat> might direct them. Instead of them operating the ship, they might do some customer service and, and earn more value, have some added value. But they are still there in case of emergency to do an evacuation or so on. So there are many different uh, possibilities out there in the future. But if we go for the fully unmanned ship, that opens up a lot of exciting possibilities. Because if we don't have people on the ship, we can redefine them. And the most obvious thing, if we don't have people on the ship, is that we don't need accommodation. So we take off the deck house. And that, of course, saves us money, space, weight, <coughs> and so on. So we can put on more cargo or have lower weight in the ship, which is lower resistance, so less power consumption. But the important thing is also to get rid of all the systems that support the crew there. Because a lot of systems in the ship is really there only to support the people like air conditioning, water production, ventilation, sewage treatment, galleys, refrigerators, and so on. We don't need that anymore. So we can actually make the ship cheaper 
to build. And it will consume less energy. Of course, if we make it unmanned, we need a redundant machinery. We need some more automation and better communication and so on. But at the end of the day, we foresee that the ship can actually become cheaper. But the most exciting thing is really just to imagine how can we redefine the whole ship. And I, we are only scratching the surface here. <coughs> what should a ship look like? There's so much tradition in ship design that's based on, on, on based old history. And, and a lot of that is the fact that you have people. So if you take out the people of the loop, I think there's real possibilities to redesign what a ship should look like. And we don't have those solutions ready yet. Okay, but in order to achieve this, there are of course some key development areas that we are addressing. So we need to make the remote control system to drive the ship. Um, basically, yeah, we want to have a better remote station than the bridge. We don't, we, we don't want to replicate the bridge of a ship. We want to have, if we do remote operation, we do it with cameras and so on, the situational awareness can be better <coughs> in the remote center than it is actually on, on existing ship. So we are developing that. We are, of course, talking about how you communicate. That's critical. So we're working with some of the leading uh, satellite uh, providers in the world on, on this. Cybersecurity is key here. And uh, then we want, of course, op if, if, we, <coughs> if a ship is going to operate by itself, it needs to do it optimum. So we are developing the how to optimize the operation. This is, of course, something we will do on manned ships as well. And then the situation awareness, where we combine different sensors. We take radar, close proximity radars, normal camera, infrared camera, and we put it all together to create basically the awareness. And, and the ship needs to be detect what type of objects are around it. So these are areas we work on. And technically the building blocks are there. So we are quite confident we can, that this will, uh, will uh, so to speak, work in, in so on. The most challenging part for us is actually the health and safety. How do we ensure that the ship is reliable enough? That's the biggest technical challenge for us. It's not really the remote operation or the, or the automation logic in there. It's really providing the reliability level that we, we want in ship. And that is, of course, a starting point when you do this. A ship, unmanned ship, needs to be as safe or safer than any existing vessel. And we will do that with, with new technology. But that's actually, if you look at marine accidents today, more than 80% of the marine accidents are related to human factors. Basically, usually, mostly because people on board are tired. They are fatigued. So if we can take and provide this better working condition and have a machine do part of the job, I think we can significantly improve this side. And so on. The other thing, of course, to stress, to, again, to say is, is Unmanned shipping is not for all types of ships. We, don't, we will not have unmanned cruise ships or big, uh, big uh, or most likely not in, 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 in the oil and gas sector either, where the risk might, uh, the reward might not uh, justify the added risk, so to speak. But we will use the same technology, even if we have people on board, to make shipping safe. But a little bit perspective on this might also be good. What is really safe? <coughs> if we have 20 seafarers out in a small vessel in the North Sea in the middle of a hurricane, or two people in, in a control room. What is safe? I mean, that's the thing. People forget that most people that are injured in marine accidents are the crew. So if we take them out of danger, we will basically also make shipping more safe. Because then it's just a material asset out there. It's not human life. And that's very important to remember. We don't want to put people in dangerous places. One topic that I'm always <coughs> asked to put in a slide on that is, is piracy. That is a big problem in shipping today. <coughs> and people say, well, if there's no crew, the pirates will have a very easy task to take over the ship. My counter argument is, is the opposite. Actually, it's more, well, they might get on board easily, but they cannot take control of the ship because you shut it down. Uh, and what do the pirates do with a ship that is not maneuverable in the middle of the ocean? They need to take it under tow. And they don't have any hostages. So then it's an easy task to take it back for the Navy. And that's the key thing, of course. If you don't have hostages, it's not as attractive either because they don't get the same ransom for it. So making ships unmanned will actually make shipping 
also more secure from the piracy point of view. The new threat is, of course, cybersecurity. And this is very vital that this is done from the beginning. But we need to recognize that cybersecurity is as important for manned ships as well. And today, unfortunately, the level of cybersecurity is not at the level it should be, in my, in my opinion. And uh, I have consulted with some experts on this. And, and, and uh, there are a lot of things we can do. Uh, but that's important. If we do unmanned ships, this will be considered from the beginning. So that's important. The other big challenge for us is then on the regulatory side. Today, there are a lot of rules which do not allow unmanned shipping. So we need to change the rules, and that will take time. I mean, marine international regulation process moves slow. And I, I, I will not go into details what all these rules are and so on. But there are some big rules that need to be changed, and that's done in IMO, where all flag states are represented. So it takes time. But that's actually guiding a little bit how we foresee the development of this unmanned ship going forward. So we foresee that the first step will be that we do not go fully unmanned. It will not happen our night. So we will do this kind of reduced manning first, where we use some of these ship intelligence products to uh, basically automate part of the functions in the ship or make them remote operated so that we can have less people on board. That's one of the first steps. Then the fully unmanned ship will start local. It might be a tug, it might be a road ferry, or some small uh, coastal cargo vessel. And the idea why we start local is because then it's in one country's water. And then one flag state can improve, basically approve the operation. We don't need the whole international maritime organization to be behind it. And then we can start much sooner. So this we want to demonstrate in, in, in basically before the decade is out. So we have three, four years time to basically get this ready and out there. And that's what we're working towards. So we want to have the first unmanned ship out there operating in a commercial application. So not a test boat, but a real application in, 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 in four years' time. Um, and then it will evolve into more coastal vessels, maybe between two countries, and then go international. And then as you go along the time frame, the operation will shift from more from more remote control to more uh, autonomous operation, and so on. So really, the starting point will be this. We use ship intelligence to, to basically take down the number of people on board, and only so we apply the function to part of the ship. And then after that, we will also do this unmanned. So it can be a road ferry like this, or something like that. The interesting thing is, of course, when we talk unmanned shipping, it's very easy that it pulls along some other technologies, like batteries. Because as, you may, as I mentioned, one of the biggest challenge for us is reliability. So if we replace the diesel engine with battery technology, it will be easier to maintain and short the, the uptime of it. So it's also a good way of, of combining other things that's happening in the marine industry and, and, and really coming up with some new interesting products. So this is a very likely future product, unmanned ferry with batteries, or it might be some other small ship. So with that, I would like to really conclude and sum up and say that we are right now at the dawn of the ship intelligence era. So it's really exciting times. A lot of things are happening and changing in this field. And there's really room for new players here. That's the interesting thing. And one of the biggest changes you will see in, in shipping will be the introduction of unmanned ships. We have seen big changes before, like the introduction of, of steam engines when they replace sailing ships. We've seen the introduction of containers that really revolutionized the whole shipping. And this is maybe up there with those kind of big changes that is coming, is the introduction of the unmanned ship. And it's coming during our, so to speak, lifetime. So it's really exciting times. And to end there with a quote from a former American president, Lincoln, the best way to predict the future is to create the future. And that's, what, that's why I know it's coming, it's because we are actually developing these solutions. Thank you.
If there are any questions, I guess I can take some questions now. Yes. Good question. OK. Uh, the question was, how, how will we handle latency in the communication when we do remote control? Good question. And well, it's basically on the fact that we don't foresee that if you operate remotely that you will do the normal throttle or, or rudder angle, so to speak. You will more operate it like a DP uh, operation. Uh, DP means dynamic position, sorry if you don't. Already today, if you go into these offshore vessels, it's you basically that needs to stay in one location within less than a meter out there in rough sea. The captain cannot do it manually. He, he has a DP system that he tells the ship, I want to move three meters to the side, and the ship does that. So in the same way, we foresee that in the remote control world, the captain will more tell the ship, now you should be there in a couple of seconds or minutes or something. And, and so he more tells the ship what to do. And then you don't have that latency. The other thing is that actually the latency is not that bad if you talk about satellite communication with the new broadband, uh, the KA band broadband that Inversat <coughs> is bringing on. You're talking mobile phone latency. And uh, for operating a ship where basically whatever you do will not really have a big impact in the first seconds at all, it's not that big a deal from, from that point of view. It's more critical if you would uh, operate an ROV underwater or something like that remotely. Where, where this latency becomes a. Yeah, okay, now it's about bandwidth and satellites and, and how when we talk, uh, we'll talk uh, satellite. Yes. First, yeah, I mean, the bandwidth of, uh, of the new satellites that are coming online is you can do video feeds. They are, they are, so to speak, uh, good enough for that. But of course, it's not. If we don't want to stream only one camera. We want to stream many cameras uh, when we do remote operation. But that's actually, if, if we say, when we are out at sea, if the ship will be autonomous. And then we will not stream pretty much any. We might maybe have a still picture every now, here and there. Uh, and the ship is more reporting some data that everything is OK. But then we, when we come, clo come close to port, then it's when we take it under remote operation. And then we will utilize uh, shore-based communication for that as well. So this communication, anyway, needs to be double. So we have the broadband satellite communication. We have a backup of, uh, of the more L-band uh, communication, which is slower, just as a backup. And then we will have shore-based uh, communication, either 4G or 5G, if that is available at that time. And, and uh, then even some other options. Uh, depending on, on operation, how, which type of ship we are talking and so on. So we really want to have many different reliable sources and we want to always optimize that we utilize <coughs> the type of communication that is best for that specific moment in time. But it's definitely a topic, yeah. Yes? Um, will you be replacing harbor pilots or will you have to retrain harbor pilots in our club? Okay, now is question. Do we want to replace harbor pilots or do we want to retrain them? Um, how should I put this? <laughs> yes and yes. <laughs> we, we foresee that the exciting opportunity is, of course, that if you have a remote control center, we, you, the same captain doesn't need to drive the ship the whole way. So it might be that one control station is for operating ships in a certain area. So the captain actually operating the ship in the control center might have the pilot license. So he's the pilot at the same time. And then you have a different control station for operating the ships into another port. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is that actually that the pilot is remotely piloting as well. That is something we're working with as well at the moment. Instead of having pilots go out to the ship, why not let them sit in office and, and, uh, and do this piloting remotely? I mean, that, that is actually e easier to do than controlling the whole ship. Except you'd need to build one remote control center for every, uh, for every version of the ship OS you have, you would need a separate remote control station for a pilot. <laughs> no, no, sorry. I, I mean, one, one remote station could cannot... You need the Android station, you need the iOS station. You need the iOS station. <laughs> well, I mean, it depends on, 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 on how... But I mean, the, the ship is the, the same remote station should be able to operate a lot of different ships. But then how you build up that model, you have, 
I mean, is it basically the ship operator who owns the, the station, or is it a separate operating managing, management company that owns it? Both options you will see in the future. And, and, but yeah, they need to be compatible to the ship. So the ship itself needs to select. It's not so that any station can control any ship in the world. That will not happen. It needs to be, they need to be, so to speak, linked together. Yes? Yeah, I mean, the question was, how long does it take to build a ship in regard to if you want to standardize? Basically, a ship today, depending on size a little bit, if it, from the order until it's ready, is between two, three years. Uh, of course, a small ship can go faster, but this is a big ship. So, um, so it's, and, and this can be a quite complicated ship, like a cruise ship or something like that. They are, I mean, a lot of engineering. Um, so what we foresee is that you would utilize in the future more standardized systems, that you would have the same system, act, identical systems in ships, independent of, of the ship, maybe be a little bit longer or shorter and so on. And that, there you could get more volume behind the system. And you need to have the same system and different shipyards. So either the shipyard needs to consolidate, or then you need to have an have a external integrator who supplies the system to really get the volume. Because we need the reliability, both for unmanned shipping, but in general. And, and the only way to get there is really to have systems that are truly optimized and validated before they go into production and trended throughout their lifetime. There's no idea if you trend a one-off system, because before we built up the know-how, I mean, it takes too long. So we need a lot of identical systems so that we can compare the data that we are logging and so on. Yes. OK, one last question. Yeah, 3D printing of ships. Uh, what's the question? How how is that evolving, Marie? Very uh, interesting and, and, and good topic that has been discussed. At the moment, uh, total ship 3D printing is we are not there, uh, and uh, I don't think it will happen because the cost of that is not compared to building steel structure. So in shipping, I more see 3D assembly as as the as the model. 3D printing will, however, be on the component level, will be very much there. Especially, I mean, the first exciting application for 3D printing is, is on the spare part side. So why not, instead of, I mean, either on board the ship or in, in each port, you would have a 3D printer, and if something fails, you just send off the, 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 the file for the part, and they print out the new spare part. And, and so, so that is where I think the first application of 3D printing in the marine business will happen. So that's where you have. Still, 3D printing is a little bit too costly to come. I mean, to to come. But it, it, it's evolving. The other thing is then, of course, if you talk other materials than steel, smaller boats to build up hulls or, or something like that, uh, then it's it's a little bit. But but big steel hulls is, is I, it will take time. But but smaller boats there, you can also start thinking about entire hull production and so on in 3D printing. So interesting topic. Oscar, thank you very much. Big hand for Oscar once more time. Thank you.